today, this weekend, it's another cold and rainy day here in Alabama. And today I am back in the outskirts of Birmingham, Alabama to tackle a story that made nationwide news. I doubt there's many people out there that haven't heard the name Natalie Holloway. Natalie Holloway was born in 1986 in Clinton, Mississippi, actually. That means she was only two years younger than me. I was born in 84. She was born in 86, so we were pretty close to the same age. It's kind of scary. After Natalie was born, she and her family, her mom Beth, her father Dave, and her brother Matt, they all moved up to Memphis, Tennessee for work. They lived there happily for some time, and then, in 1993, Natalie's parents decided to get a divorce. They stayed in Memphis for a few years after the divorce. And then, Natalie's mom met a man named George Twitty. He was a prominent Alabama businessman. They dated for several years. And by the year 2000, George and Beth had gotten married. And Natalie, Matt, and Beth all moved right here into this home here in Mountain Brook, Alabama with George. Natalie quickly settled in and made friends. She liked Leonard Skinner in Sweet Home, Alabama. I mean, who doesn't, right? And she was obsessed with The Wizard of Oz. As Natalie transitioned from middle school to high school, she and some of her friends got a weekend job right here at this organic food grocery store. Natalie then got involved in dancing like dancing for teams she tried out for and made the mountain brook high school dance team and she was pretty good at it too we now proudly present the mountain brook high school spartan marching band In 2005, Natalie graduated from right here at Mountain Brook High School as a pretty popular person. Everyone loved her. Just two days later, after the graduation, Natalie and 124 other seniors and seven adult chaperones, they all hit the road, or the air rather, and they flew down to the Caribbean island of Aruba for a five-day senior trip. During that five-day trip, the teenagers didn't have a schedule or an itinerary or anything. Pretty much, they could just come and go as they pleased. So, needless to say, 17 and 18-year-olds out on their own for the very first time meant there was lots of wild partying and room switching, and there was a whole, whole lot of drinking alcohol. In Aruba, the legal drinking age is only 18, so almost all of the teenagers that went on the trip could drink while they were down there as much as they wanted, and they did. When all of the Mountain Brook High School students arrived in Aruba on May the 26th, like I said, two days after their graduation, they all stayed right here at this Holiday Inn in Aruba. According to all of the other students who went on the trip, Natalie drank alcohol the entire time she was there. From sun up to sundown, she got up in the morning drinking mimosas and spent the rest of the day drinking beer or cocktails on May 26th, 27, 28, and May 29th. Natalie's classmates saw her. She was drinking and partying and, and having a good time it was on the 
evening on the night of May the 29th of 2005, they had already had a fun field day and they all decided to go to a bar in Aruba called Carlos and Charlie's. On the morning of May 30th, at about 1.30 a.m., Natalie was seen leaving Carlos and Charlie's and getting into a car with three men. That was the last time anyone saw Natalie Holloway alive ever again. Police in Aruba are investigating the disappearance of an Alabama high school student. Just a few hours later, you know, creeping up probably on like eight or nine in the morning, the seven chaperones that went on the trip, they started trying to round everyone up so that they could head to the airport and come back to Alabama. All the chaperones and students were kind of hanging out in the lobby and the chaperones were like counting everyone to make sure they had everyone when they noticed that one person is missing and they figure out that it's Natalie. So they walk back up to her room and start knocking on her door. They get no answer. They're thinking maybe she's had too much to drink and she's passed out. So they get the maintenance guy at the Holiday Inn to come open the door to her room. And when the chaperones go into her room, to their surprise, Natalie Holloway was nowhere to be found. They did find in her room, laying on her bed, Natalie's suitcase was laying there and the lid of it was open and all of her clothes were stacked in it. And laying right beside it on the bed was her passport. It was almost like she was getting ready to come back home and she just vanished. Last February, almost an entire year ago now, me and Amy, we took a trip to Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge in Tennessee. And while we were there, we went to the Alcatraz East True Crime Museum. In that museum, we got to see some of Natalie's clothes. In fact, it was the exact clothes that she wore on the day that she disappeared. There's a photo taken of her standing on the beach with a couple of other people wearing this exact outfit. And then I guess they all went back to their rooms and changed. And then they went to Carlos and Charlie's. And then, as I just said, she vanished right after leaving there. Now, once the adult chaperones realized that Natalie's nowhere to be found, they called the police to get some help. The uh, Aruba authorities waste no time like looking around. They go up and down the beach, but they have no luck. So after a few hours of searching with no sign of Natalie, the chaperones begrudgingly call back home and talk to her mom. Well, in return, Natalie's mom, Beth, immediately tells them that she knew something was wrong. She could feel it in her gut. Like her intuition was telling her something wasn't right. So in a quick hurry, Beth and Natalie's stepfather, George Twitty, along with several of their friends, they all catch the very next flight out of Birmingham, Alabama, headed to Aruba. It's nearly a seven hour flight from Birmingham to Aruba. I can only imagine what went through Beth's head during that seven hour flight. I mean, it must have been horrible. And then that seven hour flight must have felt like it was 14 hours. It, it, I'm sure it was probably the longest flight she's ever taken in her head. Once they all land in Aruba, Natalie's mom, um, Beth, immediately goes to the Aruba police and asks them what they know. Have they found her? Do they know anything? The Aruba police say, no, we've searched all over. We can't find her. So Beth, like, goes into to full detective mode. She goes to the rest of the group who's still there. They had to push back their flight because they were looking for Natalie. So she goes to the rest of them and she talks to them, find out what they know. She talks to the chaperones, you know, and she, she gets the information that they last saw her leaving Carlos and Charlie's early in the morning. So Beth rushes over to that bar and asks about Natalie. The bar manager there winds up showing Beth the security footage from the night before where she can actually see Natalie at the bar and in the casino. And she sees on the tape Natalie interacting with one of the men that she was seen leaving with. 
Now, the bar manager didn't know them by name. He didn't know who they were. He had only seen them a few times before. So Beth quickly grabs a copy of that tape and she carries it back to the Holiday Inn and asks all the other students if they recognize them. They don't. So she, she just so happened to take it up to the front desk and said, have you ever seen this guy before? One of the employees at the Holiday Inn knew all three men by name. They told Beth, that the three men Natalie left the bar with was 17-year-old Aruban native Joran Vandersloot and two of his friends who were also brothers, Deepak and Satish Kalpoe. On top of knowing their names, that Holiday Inn employee also gave Beth Joran Vandersloot's home address. So within four hours of landing in Aruba, Beth was able to go back to the Aruban police she gave them the security video and all three of the men's names and Joran Vandersloot's address. Unbelievably, the Aruban investigators, they knew none of this. They had not checked on any of it at this point. They hadn't talked to anyone. They just kind of searched up and down the beaches and the surrounding areas around the hotel and that was pretty much it. It turns out Joran Vandersloot he was well known all across Aruba. He was the son of a judge and he was the godson of the police chief in Aruba. Anywhere he went all over the island, most of the people knew him. So with two Aruba police officers in tow, Beth, George, and all of their friends walk up to Jordan Vandersloot's home, they bang on the door, and they demand to know where Natalie is. Joran initially denied knowing who they were talking about, but then the, the two police officers step in and kind of put a little pressure on him, and he changes his story. He tells Beth that he did leave the bar with Natalie and the Calpoe brothers, but that after they left the bar, they went to a place called Arashi Beach. Natalie wanted to see the sharks who supposedly hang out out there in the ocean. And then he says that they took her back to the Holiday Inn and dropped her off at about 2 a.m. He tells them that after they dropped her off, they drove off. But as they were driving off, Joran Vandersloot saw a black male walk up to Natalie he said that he was wearing what appeared to be a security officer's uniform, black pants, black shirt, black hat, but he wasn't for sure. After talking with Joran Vandersloot, widespread searches got underway in Aruba with hundreds of volunteers from not only Aruba, but the people from the American embassy in Aruba, um, other American vacationers who were in Aruba. The Aruban government gave all of their civil servants time off so they could join in with the searches. So they had like teachers and the, the postmen and even some emergency responders. They sent the Dutch military in to help do searching. It was wild. Police joined by well-wishers scour Aruba's beaches for signs of Natalie Holloway. And her mother Beth makes an emotional pledge about her missing daughter. Our primary goal is to bring Natalie back home. We will do whatever it takes. As I've said from the beginning, I'm not leaving Aruba without her. The banks in Aruba, they offered up nearly $20,000 in support to aid the searches with supplies like food and water and stuff. The Aruban government provided Beth and George with a free hotel room at the Holiday Inn. In fact, they were staying in the same room that Natalie was in. So they like slept in that same room with Natalie's suitcase and, and all of her stuff while they were doing all the searching. On June the 5th of 2005, the Aruban police arrested two men for the suspicion of kidnapping Natalie Holloway. Both men were security guards for a nearby hotel that was called Allegro. The authorities said that they made those arrests based on statements made by Joran Vandersloot and the Calpoe brothers. On June 13th, both men were released. They actually had alibis for the night that Natalie disappeared. Now, the police knew that Joran and the Calpoe brothers had lied to them. So as these two security guards were being released, Joran and the Calpoe brothers were arrested and brought 
in at the same time. Like they kind of pass each other probably. But in Aruba, the laws down there require police to kind of like show their work. Like if they're in school, they have to show their evidence. And it has to be like increasing over time. So at first the police said, you know, that the three men were the last seen with her. They all three had, you know, police records. And for the time being, this worked. All three men were held in jail, but the judge said at the next hearing they needed more evidence. So the Aruban police and the Dutch military, they ramped up their searches. They deployed F-16 fighter jets to start searching the shorelines. They started comparing like satellite images of the Aruba coastline, looking for unexpected shifts in the dirt and disturbances, that kind of stuff. It was at this point that all three men who were still in jail, they all come back and change their stories. This is for the second time now. Joran Vandersloot and the Kalpoe brothers were now saying that, yes, they did pick Natalie up, but they dropped off Natalie and Joran at the Holiday Inn. There was no security guard involved. All three of them said that, that this was the plan because Natalie wanted to sleep with Joran. After Natalie and Joran got out, the Kalpoes left and they pretty much don't know what happened after that. Then Joran tells them that uh, after he and Natalie got it on out on the beach, even though she had a room upstairs, after they got it on, that he left Natalie just like laying out there on the beach by herself and he doesn't know what happened to her afterwards. So now Joran has pretty much just given the Kalpoe brothers an alibi saying that he was there, but they left. So a judge ruled that the Kalpoe brothers should be released from jail and they were. This kind of started a scuffle too, because right after they were released, Beth gave an interview. And in that interview, she said that two violent criminals has just been released by the Aruban Authority. It is now that I ask the world to help me. Two suspects were released yesterday who were involved in a violent crime against my daughter. Help me by not allowing these two to get away with this crime. Her statements ticked off just about everybody in Aruba. I mean, it made everybody mad. A group, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people from Aruba then came down to the courthouse and held a demonstration condemning her statements. And some of them were holding up signs that said innocent until proven guilty. And there was others that had signs that said respect our laws or go home. It, it started a big mess. I would like to apologize to the Aruban people and the Aruban authorities if I or my family offended you in any way. It was never my intention to do so. But it was quickly overshadowed because like I said, the Kalpoes were out. Jordan Vandersloot was still in, but he waited until they got out. So he comes back and now changes his story again. Now he tells authorities that the Kalpoe brothers dropped him off at home first. And Natalie left with the Kalpoe brothers. So, you know, he waited until they released them to now come back and change his story again. But this time pointing the finger at them. So when it came time for the authorities to go in front of the judge again to keep holding Joran Vandersloot in jail, they had to go up and tell the judge everything that had happened and show him what evidence they did have and try to explain to him that everyone just keeps lying. By the end of it, the police tell that judge that they really weren't ready to arrest the three men yet they blamed it on Beth and George saying that um, they made the arrest when they did because of pressure from Natalie's family. Natalie, you can reach me on your cell phone. I have it and it's set up for international use now and, and I will stay here until I find you, Natalie. The judge pretty much said they didn't have enough evidence to continue holding Joran Vandersloot in jail. So he was gonna be released, but he was gonna hold him for 60 days because he had at least lied to the authorities three different times, but at the end of that 60 days, he was to be released unless the police could you know, prove that he had done something. 
uh, after learning that he was going to be getting out in 60 days, Natalie's family popped up and offered nearly a million dollars for the safe return of Natalie Holloway. They also offered a hundred thousand dollars for information that led to them finding where her remains were. So, uh, people came up with tips and leads from everywhere after that because they wanted that money. I assure you that every, every, every lead is being worked out. Please help bring her home. Thank you. On August the 26th of 2005, while Joran was still serving his 60 days, the police go back and re-arrest the Calpoe brothers again for Natalie's kidnapping. But this time, not only did they arrest the two brothers, they also arrested another man, 21-year-old Freddy Armbatis. Now, Armbatis was brought in because investigators learned of an incident where he and the Calpoe brothers and Joran Vandersloot, they all sexually assaulted a young girl who was underage. And while they were in the act of assaulting her, they took inappropriate pictures of her. And she was a minor, and they did it all against her will. Now, I'm leaving this girl's name out, obviously, because she was a minor and a victim. But she was visiting Aruba on vacation, just like Natalie was. So, the Aruban authorities thought that uh, all four men may have tried to do the same thing with Natalie. And... This time, though, they just took it a step further. That way, she couldn't tell what happened like this other young girl did. Now, just 10 days after they arrested the Calpoe brothers again and Freddie Armbatis, a judge said that the cop's suspicion just wasn't enough evidence. They needed proof of it, and the judge released all four men from jail, including Jordan Vandersloot. A major development this morning in the Natalie Holloway case, a judge in Aruba is releasing prime suspect Joran Vandersloot from jail. After Joran was released, he went on a media tour. He gave interviews to TV stations and newspapers from all over the world. During this time, he gave his fifth different story as to what happened, now saying that it was Natalie who tried to sleep with him but he turned her down and walked away and left her alone. Okay. I don't know who really believed that, but whatever. That whole time period was a media frenzy. You have overstayed your bloody welcome in our island. And even Dr. Phil got in on it for ratings, I believe. Dr. Phil aired a special on Natalie Holloway, and he aired a tape that he had gotten somehow of one of the Calpoe brothers admitting that all three men gang raped Natalie. When he aired that tape, it caused such an uproar for the Calpoe brothers and Joran Vandersloot to be rearrested that the Aruban authorities had to come forward and pretty much expose the Dr. Phil show. I mean, they claimed that Dr. Phil edited that tape for ratings and they had proof of it. So the Aruban government released the actual tape where the Calpoe brothers said, no, we did not gang rape her. They pretty much proved that Dr. Phil cut the part out where he said, no, we didn't to, I don't know, start some kind of mess or get ratings or whatever, for whatever the reason, they proved that Dr. Phil had edited it. It all resulted in the Calpoe brothers filing a slander lawsuit against Dr. Phil. And then in retaliation for that lawsuit, Dr. Phil had Natalie's parents file a wrongful death lawsuit against the Calpoe's. It was a giant mess. Ultimately, in the end, both cases were dismissed, but man, it was a mess. After Jordan finished up with his press tour, given all these interviews. He left Aruba to try to get away from it all. And he ended up in Bangkok, Thailand. Now, when he got to Bangkok, he did some gambling and he wound up winning a bunch of money. So he opened up his own coffee shop in Bangkok called Sawadi Cup. It was on the campus of Rangsit University in, um, you know, I mean, he did pretty good business. It 
however, was short-lived though, because an undercover sting operation took place by the Thailand authorities that caught Jordan Vandersloot drugging and kidnapping young Thai women and selling them into a sex slave group. Those girls were sent to the Netherlands and forced to prostitute under the threat of being hurt or their families being killed. Joran was paid $13,000 for each girl that he kidnapped and the undercover operation showed, you know, I mean, he had at least six or seven girls there in the room at one time and that was just one trip. He had done this several times. Well, the undercover operation went on and just before the Thai authorities were about to kick in the door to arrest Joran, he had sold off the coffee shop and fled to Holland. When he got to Holland, uh, he enrolled in a few college classes, actually. He never finished those classes because he spent most of his time gambling in casinos and getting drunk and smoking pot in coffee shops in Holland. Well, while this was all going on back in Aruba, Natalie's story had kind of stalled. The search parties were still searching, but there was nowhere near as many searchers and they weren't finding anything. Really though, all signs kept pointing back to Joran Vandersloot. They just didn't have proof. A whole year passed in this rut with pretty much no new evidence and no new information. So Joran seemingly, he feels lost without the constant media attention so, Joran Vandersloot released a book worldwide that was called Dizak Natalie Holloway. He openly said that uh, he made the book to profit from the world knowing his name and to get his story out. The world was invested in what happened to Natalie Holloway. Now, although they claim that it had nothing to do with the book, just two days after the book released, the Aruban and Dutch police raided Joran's Aruba home. Now, while they were there, they did take Joran's computer and on it, they found messages where Joran was telling some of his friends his six different story. In those messages, he told his friends that he was 100% certain Natalie Holloway is dead and now he was saying that her body was dumped out into the ocean where no one would ever find it. Because of them finding those messages on Joran's computer, both Calpoe brothers were arrested and Joran Vandersloot was arrested again. He wasn't in Aruba at this time. Like I said, he was over in Holland, but he was extradited back to Aruba. And uh, this time the arrest was for manslaughter. In a heavy blow, to authorities, the judge again said that they did not have enough evidence to hold the three men. The judge flat out told them pretty much, you have no evidence proving their guilt. And he pretty much told them, do not arrest these men again unless you have undisputable proof they killed this girl. And the judge ordered that Vandersloot and the Calpoes were released, were to be released from prison. 10 days later, the Aruban prosecutor's office officially declared that Natalie's case is now closed. It's unsolved, but closed. This was absolutely devastating to Natalie's family. There would be no more searching, no more investigating, nothing. They would never get any answers or justice. So, I mean, they were crushed. For about two weeks there, it seemed like it was all over with they were just giving up on Natalie. And then a Dutch TV news reporter came forward claiming that Joran Vandersloot had confessed to him that yes, he did kill Natalie Holloway. And this news reporter said that he had the proof and he was gonna air it on live TV. Of course, before the program actually aired, Joran tried to get ahead of it. And he made statements saying that uh, he lied to the reporter just to be friends with him and he just told him what he wanted to hear because he thought he was a drug dealer. Either way, within one hour of the reporter coming out and making this claim, 
the Aruban authorities announced that they were reopening Natalie's case. The next day, just as the reporter had said, the Dutch TV station that he worked for aired the footage he was talking about. And in the video, he gives his seventh different story as to what happened. Oh, what the fuck is that, you know? Nooit meer te vinden. Waar precies weet ik zelf ook niet. Hoe kan het je dat niet weten? And this time he said that Natalie overdosed while they were having sex on the beach that night. And um, he, Natalie was laying there shaking and convulsing and he panicked. And he called a friend instead of calling 911. Joran says that that friend came and then the friend took Natalie's body out and dropped her in the ocean. On November the 24th of 2008, Joran Vandersloot gave an interview with Fox News here in America. And in that interview, Joran gives his eighth different version of events. This time, Joran claims that he kidnapped Natalie Holloway and sold her to a sex slave group like he did in Thailand. He told the world that Natalie Holloway was still alive, but that she was being forced to do some of the most horrific stuff you could imagine Joran also claimed that she was in Venezuela. After the interview had ended, you know, as like he normally does, Joran came back and recanted everything that he said and, and said it was all a lie. But by that point, it was pretty much too late because Natalie's family heard it and it got their hopes up again. Natalie's family, you know, was thinking that Natalie was still alive. And even though she had been forced to do some of this horrible stuff, she was still alive. So they had got their hopes up and uh, they expanded their searching now into Venezuela trying to find her. They didn't give up at all. They never did. On March the 29th of 2010, Joran Vandersloot called Natalie's mother, Beth. Joran said to her, basically, Natalie's dead. And he offered to tell them where her body was if they gave him $250,000 with a $25,000 advance. Beth did the right thing here, and uh, she immediately called the FBI. With the FBI on board, they arranged to get the money and it being marked bills, and they arranged for surveillance over the whole thing. So she called him back and told him, yeah, she would take the deal. So they wired Joran Vandersloot $15,000 to his account in the Netherlands. And then Beth sent him $10,000 in cash that he was to go pick up in the Netherlands. When Joran, uh, you know, actually took possession of the cash, the FBI had undercover officers there filming the whole transaction so that they had proof that it was Joran who had done this extortion. Right after he picked up the cash, Joran called Beth and he gave her the address of a home in Aruba where he said that he and his father buried Natalie in the foundation of that home. Well, right away, the FBI knew that he was lying because that home didn't exist in 2005, back when it all happened. But they went ahead and did their due diligence anyways, and they went to that home and they uprooted a family and destroyed their house to look in the foundation of that home. But of course, Natalie wasn't there. On June 3rd of 2010, the U.S. District Court of Alabama issued an arrest warrant for Joran Vandersloot for extortion and wire fraud. The very next day, special agents from the FBI and Interpol served search warrants on two different homes in the Netherlands where they suspected that Joran Vandersloot was living. But Joran was nowhere to be found in either one. While all of this was going on, though, on May 30th, which coincidentally was five years to the day after Natalie disappeared, Stephanie Flores, a 21-year-old college student, she was reported missing by her family in Peru. Stephanie was found three days later in a hotel room in Lima, Peru, that room 
had been checked out by none other than Joran Vandersloot. The day after they found her body in that hotel room, Joran was spotted and arrested in Chile, where he had obviously fled after killing Stephanie. He was very quickly expedited back to Peru, and he actually confessed to killing her. In a vivid description he gave to law enforcement, Joran said that Stephanie and he had met early in the day on May the 30th in a casino there in Lima, and uh, they met because he went and talked to her after she had just won a $10,000 jackpot. So after they talked, they went back to his room to get it on. And then after they got it on, they were on his laptop playing online poker. And while they were playing poker, a message popped up that alluded to Joran's involvement in Natalie's death. When Stephanie saw the message, she questioned him about it. And uh, it, it got to the point where she was upset and she wound up slapping him. Well, when she slapped him, Joran said that in that moment, he just lost it. He don't know what happened, and it was it was like he didn't have control of his body. And he wound up strangling her, and he beat her with a tennis racket. Then he took all of her cash that she won, all of her jewelry, all of her credit cards. He packed his bags, and he fled to Chile. On his way out, he told the people working at the front desk that since he was paid up for several days, he didn't want anyone going up to the room and bothering his woman, who was up there supposedly sleeping. Several months later, Joran was, uh, he was in jail there in Peru waiting for his trial, and the Peruvian officials granted a Reuben authorities access to come talk to Jordan. Oh. So a Reuben authorities flew to Peru and they sit down in a room and talk to him. And Joran admitted to extorting Beth Twitty, Natalie's mom. He said that he wanted to get back at her for, and this is a direct quote. He said that he wanted to get back at her for making his life tough for the last five years. He also said that he snapped on Stephanie Flores because of all the stress that Beth's harassment and all of her accusation had caused. Basically, uh, he's saying that it was Beth's fault that he killed Stephanie Flores. On January the 11th of 2012, Joran Vandersloot pled guilty to the murder of Stephanie Flores. He was sentenced to 28 years in a Peruvian prison. Just days after Joran pled guilty to Stephanie's murder, Natalie's dad, Dave Holloway, he had lost all hope, pretty much. And he knew that Joran was gonna be in jail for 30 years. So he went to the circuit courts of Alabama and he filed a petition to declare Natalie Holloway legally deceased so he could, you know, take care of her estate. Well, he did this without Beth being on board. So when she found out, obviously, she tried to fight it. Uh, you know, she didn't want to think that her daughter was actually dead. So they wound up having a hearing on September the 23rd. And in that hearing, Judge Alan King sided with Dave Holloway. And he signed the order declaring Natalie Holloway officially deceased. Joran, he's over in prison serving his 28-year sentence. And uh, initially, the prison that he was at, Miguel Castro Prison, it was a media circus. Just like what we saw with uh, the Chris Watts case, after Joran was sentenced to prison, he started getting fan mail and pictures of women in bikinis and requests from women to marry him. One letter he, that he got from a woman even said that she wanted to carry his baby. It's nuts. News stations from all over the world requested interviews with Joran. They paid off guards to let them go into Joran's cell and film it while he was outside or taking a shower or whatever. I mean, famously, even Beth Holloway 
she traveled to Peru and actually succeeded in sneaking into the prison with a camera crew. Like she pretended to be part of the camera crew and snuck in. And she even got to talk to Joran for just a moment before, you know, they pretty much found out and kicked her out. I just listened to me for just a couple of minutes. I have not any hate in me, Yvonne. I have none. It's too late for Natalie. It's too late for Stephanie. It's too late for me. But it's not too late for you, Yvonne, to, to get your life back. Because I want to know what happened. And I want to move on, Yvonne. I want to move on. In 2016, a former roommate of Joran Vandersloot's best friend came forward and he claimed that he knew what happened to Natalie Holloway. Uh, his name was John Ludwig and he claimed that Joran Vandersloot paid him to dig up Natalie's remains and cremate them. Dave Holloway then hired a private investigator to check up on this guy and to also review the whole case and to see what he could dig up and if they missed anything. Well, that private eye actually did find human remains buried on the beach near the Holiday Inn where Natalie was staying while she was there. And that led to news agencies everywhere reporting that they found Natalie. A white female human, a young white female human jawbone has been found on the strip where Natalie Holloway last day, the hotel strip there on the Aruban beaches. I mean, obviously they did DNA testing on it. And a few weeks later that the test came back and they were not the bones of Natalie Holloway, but another woman. All it really did was crush Natalie's family all over again, because they believed they had found her and then they found out they didn't. That uh, John Ludwig, who said that he cremated Natalie and he was paid by Joran, uh, he tried to kidnap a woman to sexually assault her. Well, the woman fought back and actually stabbed Ludwig to death. He died from trying to kidnap a woman of his own. It's crazy. I mean, these guys from Aruba who kidnap and abuse women, they just keep popping up everywhere. Two years after Joran Vandersloot pled guilty to murdering Stephanie Flores, his fellow inmates at Miguel Castro Prison they were tired of the living conditions inside of the prison. So they came up with an idea to uh, start shedding some light on the appalling conditions that they lived in. So one day while all the prisoners were going outside for their recreation time, a group of inmates with prison made shanks, they walked up to Joran and they cornered him and they stabbed him in the stomach multiple times. Joran was rushed to a nearby hospital and he actually survived his injuries. It was afterwards when he got sent back to jail from the hospital that he was being brought back in and he met a woman. She was there at the prison and not as an inmate, but as a visitor, she was visiting her brother who was an inmate there at the prison. And uh, Joran just happened to be coming back from the hospital when they met. So after visitation time later that day, Joran went and talked to this inmate, to the brother of this girl, and convinced him to give Joran her phone number. So Joran and this woman started talking. Well, two months of just talking on the phone and there was a few visits here and there, Joran Vandersloot and Lydie Yusita were allowed to get married inside of the prison. They were allowed to have conjugal visits and she turned up pregnant. So now Joran Vandersloot has a child named Dushy. D-U-S-H-Y Vandersloot. Dushy Vandersloot. In 2016, a friend of Joran Vandersloot's who visited him in jail, they snuck in a hidden camera and they recorded Joran, who was sitting right next to his wife, admitting that he had lied the entire time and that he did kill Natalie Holloway. Joran could be seen on that video talking about Natalie's death and laughing and joking. And like I said, his wife was right there beside him. She heard and saw everything that he said. But to this day, she still stands by him. I have always the justice always lied. No one knew it. I was able to Ja, maar die heeft niet over de zaak uh, Holloway. Ja, ja. 
Ja. Ja. Ja. Ja. Ja. Ja. Ja. Ja. Ja. He is, uh, well, he's scheduled to be released in 2038. He should be immediately extradited here to Alabama to serve time for that extortion and wire fraud. And I can promise you if Natalie's parents or the state of Alabama or the FBI have anything to do with it, he'll be here. Because they'll more than likely never get a murder conviction from him for Natalie they're probably going to throw the book at him for those two charges and give him as much time as they can. That's just my opinion. That's what I would assume, anyway. Several years after Joran went to prison, Beth and George Twitty, who, I mean, they had been torn apart over Natalie's disappearance, they eventually separated and divorced. Beth Twitty, she went on to establish the International Safe Travels Foundation, which uh, basically it informs and educates people on traveling safely while they're traveling abroad. Beth also started the Natalie Holloway Resource Center in Washington, D.C., which helps the families of people who are missing. Beth would then go on to do everything she could to help other families who went through this. She hosted her own TV show on the Lifetime channel that was called Vanished. In 2005, I got the call telling me that my daughter, Natalie, had vanished. Every parent's worst nightmare became my reality. Anytime a young girl comes up missing, Beth helped join in the search. And Beth gets involved in those things as often as she can. Even though they know that none of this they're doing is gonna bring Natalie back at this point, their goal is to maybe, just maybe, stop it from happening to someone else. Natalie Holloway has not been found to date, even though many people will believe she has. She's not been found, nor has she had any kind of justice. It's sad. That is gonna do it for this video today here in Mountain Brook, Alabama. I wanna thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you're new here, go down, hit that subscribe button, then hit that notification bell so you get notified every time I upload a video. If you're wanting to help support the channel, you can check out the links in the description box below. Thank you all so much. I will see you again tomorrow. Please stay safe and stay healthy. Much love to you all.